Hey GBC family, Zach and Simon here again together uh, to talk about, have a conversation about apologetics. And today in particular, we're excited to talk about the resurrection. And so, um, which is really at the core of the gospel, wouldn't you say? Oh yeah, definitely. The resurrection of Jesus is uh, the most significant event in human history and not just for Christians, but for everyone. So this is a really important topic uh, for us to be able to understand and to study on a regular basis, I would say. And I would, I would say for those out there who are struggling and have questions about God or you go through scripture and you find yourself wrestling through implications of things you read in the text, it's all, it, for, for me, when I have conversations with people, it's always helpful to come back to the resurrection. Do we know the resurrection is true? Because if that domino falls, it allows us to process in a more fair way, in a more comprehensive way, the rest of the dominoes that fall. As you think about the nature of God, the character of God, what, the reliability of scripture, etc. cetera. So um, let's just start off with what is the significance of the resurrection? Why does it even matter? The importance of the resurrection is a multifaceted jewel. We're not gonna be able to touch on all of the significance of it, but uh, where I'm gonna start is that uh, this is an actual historical event. And uh, the fact that this is an actual historical event is a very scandalous thing about Christianity. The truth of our faith, of our worldview is grounded in an actual historical event. And that's very different from other religions out there that uh, are more anecdotal, are more, uh, other religions can be true without certain historical events actually happening from their perspective. So that's a very important uh, distinction from Christianity from other religions. Another key feature of the resurrection is that it vindicates the uh, life and teachings of Jesus, especially his claims regarding himself. If the resurrection is true, then those become more trustworthy. They become trustworthy. They're proof that he's yes. actually speaking the truth. You know, uh, Jesus made some outlandish claims and uh, outlandish actions while he was uh, doing his earthly ministry. You know, saying that he's Lord of the Sabbath, which is literally God's day, mm -hmm. sanctified to God. When he said before Abraham was, I am. Exactly. So these powerful statements that are in and of themselves very scandalous are vindicated because Jesus raised bodily from the dead. Another significance of the resurrection is a justification for the Christian hope that we too will be resurrected just like our Lord. What this does is that it brings more significance to our earthly life and towards our sufferings as Christians in this current age. As far as suffering goes, you know, we, we have such a temporary perspective and oftentimes we even find ourselves praying as if this life is all that is. And uh, when eternity is really that thing to which we get to put our hope in and the resurrection purchases in a lot of ways or provides hope for the eternity that we actually have. And so I always give Christians a hard time when they have bucket lists. You know what I mean? Because you're gonna have eternity on the new heavens, the new earth to do everything that you want, at least on the new heavens and the new earth. In terms of the suffering that we experience in the here and now, we can endure that suffering knowing that one, we're bearing the cross that Christ bore, but then two, that we get to share in the victory over Satan, sin, and death that Christ was able to do when he resurrected from the dead himself. There are people in the past who've tried to, uh, very, like liberal, um, uh, in the 1940s, Rudolf Bultmann, demythologization, in which they tried to mythify the resurrection. But fortunately, there's just been overwhelming amounts of scholarship debunking that, even for all the influence that it garnered in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Uh, but having said that, what are some of the ways that Christians justify their belief in the resurrection? There's a lot of different ways to go about justifying belief in the resurrection. And it could just be as simple as uh, uh, having it the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, being a Christian and uh, sensing that it is true. And uh, that is a justification in itself. But uh, there's a lot more. It could also be through personal experiences. Like a, a, a lot of Muslims are coming to faith in Christianity through dreams, Jesus appearing to them in dreams. And because of the significance of this 
uh, experience, they are then justified in also believing in the resurrection because this, uh, this person is the resurrection and the life. And that's how he presents himself to them in these dreams and these visions. Uh, but also there's uh, the more typical way of uh, um, historical evidences. Now before we get to that, one of the things, and this probably lines up with historical evidence, but you know, I find myself sharing with people is the spread of Christianity just on its own. I and mean, we'll get into the actual like burial and then that stuff, but just the spread. And when you think about the torture, the torment, the persecution, and the martyrdom of the early Christians, people will die for what they know is true, but no one's gonna die for what they know is a lie. And yet you had uh, follower after follower claiming Jesus is raised from the dead, not recanting it, and then dying holding to them testifying to having actually seen it, having actually touched him. And that's, that's powerful sociological evidence, I would say, um, though there's a lot more to go with that. So let's, certainly is. let's get into some of the nuts and bolts of the, the uh, resurrection claims itself. What, are, what would be some of the things people try to debunk? the resurrection with? What are some of the claims that people are like, nah, the resurrection didn't happen because, what would some of those arguments be? Uh, some of them would be a priori arguments, uh, such as uh, the notion that the miracles are invalid, okay. that we, we cannot, uh, via historical uh, studies or anything like that, to determine whether or not something was a miracle. And the problem with that is it assumes something. It assumes a naturalistic worldview, which we've talked about in the past, yep. which everything must have a natural cause, but that completely excludes the supernatural or God um, who, who, who operates in all sorts of different ways. Exactly, yeah. Um, we have to just assume that God doesn't exist in order to discount miracles. Um, another aspect uh, uh, regarding miracles uh, that uh, goes into what historians call like a Bayesian calculation with regard to whether or not something was likely to occur it has to deal with uh, priors on the calculation. And uh, if you do grant that God exists and is capable of interacting with the physical world and perform these miracles, then what reason do we have to believe that God would want to raise Jesus from the dead? So uh, one of the things that go into this calculation is whether or not God himself would want to become incarnate. And uh, if God is a God of love um, and wants to have a relationship with humanity, then it actually makes sense that this mm. God would want to relate to us on, this, on a level that we can really comprehend. In a uh, familial relationship in flesh and blood that we can actually touch and hold and look to and uh, uh, worship it in the flesh. John That's 1 14. A, Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. So, so that is a really important aspect for why you would want to think that, yes, God would want to raise Jesus from the dead because Jesus is God. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and also when we talk about Jesus, he, he's earned, uh, the, the life because he never died spiritually by actually from committing sin. Jesus never committed sin, so he never became separated from God in the way that we do as fallen sinful creatures. So there's no way for death to have hold on him. Yeah. When I think about the resurrection, you know, and conversations with people about the resurrection, I hear people say, uh, he never really died. Okay. Um, I hear people say, uh, the guards were paid off. Um, yeah. I hear people say, like they, they, there's, there's ways that people try to, because we know the cross happened and then people saw him and they try to connect those dots and get rid of a death. Yeah. Um, or there's even a PhD done on a collective mushroom hallucination uh, that, that, that everyone had and they all saw Jesus together because of this collective hallucination. So you have this weird stuff, okay? Yeah. Can you walk me through what you would consider good evidences that he truly died, he was in the tomb three days, and that he truly was raised from the dead? Yeah, so th there's a, when we were talking about methodologies used for providing justification for belief, th there's a, two major ones when you go through the historical evidences. Uh, one of them is a maximal 
a historical view in which it, it endeavors to sh prove that the Gospels are reliable accounts. Um, and the second one is called the minimal facts approach, uh, which is generally seen to be a little bit easier and usually what people talk about when they want to justify the the belief in the resurrection and that's kind of what you're referring to and so there's a how the minimal facts approach to the historic historicity of the resurrection goes is uh, looking at what the scholars agree on is historical features of jesus's life and then it, using those points of agreement to show that the christian hypothesis is the most reasonable hypothesis and one of them is uh, the death of Jesus in Jerusalem, the uh, burial of uh, Jesus by Joseph of Arimathea, the discovery of the empty tomb by a group of uh, Jesus' woman followers, and then the genuine belief that the disciples uh, uh, experience appearances of the Lord Jesus after the discovery of the empty tomb. So what we have here is uh, the death, burial, resurrection, and the appearances. And if, uh, and if we agree that those are historical, then we can determine what hypothesis best explains those mm. points of agreement. <clears throat> and there's a few different uh, uh, ways to go about it. There's some people that would agree, yeah, um, that Jesus uh, died, but uh, uh, the reason why the tomb was empty was because Jesus was never in a tomb. He was thrown into a common pit, uh, which is uh, normally associated with Bart Ehrman, that he was... Uh, thrown into a, a common pit of criminals and uh, uh, was eaten by dogs, basically. And then what you already referred to is uh, the appearances are explained by hallucinations. The most important thing to learn from these alternative hypotheses is that they're more complicated. They're more ad hoc because you need more hypothesis in order to explain all the data. Mm -hmm. You need to have Jesus not actually be put in a tomb or the, that his body was stolen and hallucinations, or and the disciples were lying about the appearances. The explanation on its own doesn't take care of all four elements. Exactly. It always requires something else. Yeah, but the Christian hypothesis, which has always been the one that was presented from the beginning and very early on, which is extremely important, yeah. is, uh, is that Jesus rose bodily from the dead. And that's the only thing that would be needed to explain all of those. You know, he actually did die in Jerusalem and he was buried by Joseph Arimathea and then he raised bodily from the tomb and he appeared unto the disciples. That's just one hypothesis. Uh, that's just one series of events um, that explains all the data smoothly. So let's start with that first one, which is Jesus died. Yeah. Like it was an actual death as opposed to he got beaten a whole bunch he went up on a cross. He didn't actually die. Yeah. Uh, because that's one way people explain it away, which seems to me to have so many fundamental challenges to it that you would be put up on a Roman cross um, for, for crimes of insurrection or whatever you want to call them. And then they would pull you off without making sure the job was done. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, oh. <laughs> It's, uh, it's funny because I saw this meme one time that was saying like, uh, one does not simply swoon, because that's a swoon theory. Yes. One does not simply swoon when they're crucified by Romans. Um, and that's true because like, uh, if the thing is, is that the Romans, that the ones that were assigned to your execution need to make sure that you were actually dead or else it was their life on the line. So uh, some people would say that uh, the, uh, the ancient people weren't very good at determining when people are dead. Uh, but the Romans were very efficient killers. And uh, it doesn't take much. Uh, in the gospel accounts, we have a testimony of a common Roman practice to verify the death of people by stabbing them with a spear, which they did to Jesus. In the heart. In the heart. And also, uh, that Jesus didn't really die, like the Muslim take is that Jesus never was crucified, but somebody was crucified in this place. 
The reason why we don't follow that tradition is because the Quran was a sixth century document that is uh, far removed from the events that occurred while the Gospels are all first century, same century that Jesus lived. So they're yeah. much more reliable and they don't say anything about Jesus being replaced. They all adamantly affirm that Jesus was crucified. One reason why people want to say that maybe Jesus didn't die on the cross was because of how early he died. You know, he died really quick, even to the point where Pilate himself marveled at it. He was like, are you sure he was dead? And that's part of the reason why they stabbed him. We have to remember that the death of crucifixion is not by bleeding out or starving to death. or Suffocation. Like exactly, it's asphyxiation. You die because you can't breathe. Mm -hmm. And that uh, takes days sometimes. That takes days, it depends on how long uh, the person is willing to endure the suffering before they just die but the Passover was you know it was going to be a high Sabbath the next day and the they weren't going to allow these uh, people to hang up on the cross uh, during that holy day and that's why they broke the legs of the thieves on either side of Jesus um, the way that you don't die of asphyxiation through a crucifixion is by using your legs to push up on the nails that are driven into your feet yeah. so that you can breathe and um, but if your legs are broken, then you can't use your legs to push up and give your chest cavity enough space so that you can breathe. And then you die of asphyxiation, which is the intended way for you to die on, of crucifixion. But they found that Jesus was already dead, so they didn't break his legs. Mm -hmm. And and so it could have been the case uh, that uh, Jesus uh, just refused to take his next, next breath or something like that. You know, so some of his closing words were, Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. And then the scripture says, and he breathed his last. Yeah. Yeah. So very interesting, very interesting stuff. Um, so that's point number one. Yeah, that's point number one. The, the death. Jesus really died. Yes. Uh, the next one is that he was buried in the tomb, uh, Joseph of Arimathea. Yes. And so what do we got? What we got is uh, the... so. A lot of people, when they do his historical Jesus studies, use what is called uh, um, criteria of authenticity. And one of the criteria of authenticity is a multiple attestation. And that's when you have uh, multiple uh, uh, documents or multiple witnesses talking about the, the same event. Mm -hmm. And in this case, Joseph of Arimathea is uh, mentioned by the Synoptic Gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And those are treated as one witness. And then there's the witness of John who also talks about Joseph of Arimathea. And so that's two witnesses. And so that if you have two witnesses of something that happened 2000 years ago, that's pretty good. Um, and so uh, it also meets the, the criteria of authenticity that's called embarrassment because uh, Joseph of Arimathea was a member of the ruling council, the, the people who condemned Jesus. And so why is the enemy taking Jesus and putting him in his own personal tomb and not the disciples, you know? Why was he doing some, this good work for Jesus when the leaders of the early church were cowering in fear? So this lends credibility to the, to the embarrassment of it. I'll also add, and you get this in particular in the Gospel of Luke, that the details added within the Gospel um, make the accounts falsifiable, which is really important. And so when names and places are used, and you think about how early in the first century these things were circulated, it actually makes it so that those who were hearing and reading this for the first time had the opportunity to, to falsify, to check the details that are given. And with that name given and that place given, that afforded them that opportunity. And yet we have zero accounts of people in the first century falsifying the information that's presented to us in these Gospels. And so falsifiability is another um, kind of tick in the credibility. Yes, that's also a, a method used for the maximal evidence approach. Oh, here I'm, I'm going too deep. Sorry, <laughs> yeah. sorry. All right, well that's point two, okay? And then point three is the empty tomb. The empty tomb, yep. Uh, so there's certain evidences that are available for the empty tomb in the form of who discovered the empty tomb. Yeah. And uh, like earlier, we mentioned the criteria of authenticity, and this uh, goes into the embarrassment 
field again. The tomb was discovered by Jesus's woman followers and reported by them. And the gospels all report that the, the women followers were the ones who first witnessed it and reported it. And, and uh, this is embarrassing because uh, the testimony of women back in the first century, especially in uh, the Palestine area was not highly regarded. And so uh, if you were going to testify to the presence of the empty tomb, then why wouldn't you use men? If They're, you were going to falsify the testimony, yeah, you, you'd probably use men, right? Yeah, if you were to falsify it or if you were to uh, present it as something that they're trying to get people to believe this, you know? So why would you use women? The only reason why you would use women is because it's true. Yeah. It's true and you want to hold to your integrity. Um, also, we have a, a testimony of enemies, uh, which is the Jews who are saying that the disciples stole the body. Mm -hmm. And if they're saying that the disciples stole the body, then they are saying, yeah, the tomb is empty. And uh, this isn't just uh, something that, uh, came, uh, that is testified in the book of Matthew. There's Jewish literature that also testifies to the fact that uh, they believe that Jesus' disciples stole the body during the night. So since you have uh, this uh, criteria of uh, um, enemy testimony and, and embarrassment, then it lends a, and also multiple attestation uh, because of John, uh, the Synoptic Gospels and then again John, uh, and also the witness of uh, Paul, who is uh, also testifying to uh, the empty tomb in his uh, letters. Th this uh, lends uh, historical credibility to the empty tomb. So we got three points so far, which was Jesus really died, buried it in the tomb, uh, the tomb was found empty. And the fourth one is he actually appeared to people. He actually appeared to people. And uh, one of the big reasons why we believe this um, is uh, because of the, uh, the fact that he appeared to groups of people and over the course of time. And uh, not just to individuals one at a time. Exactly. So this actually undercuts a common theory, which is that the, the disciples uh, hallucinated Jesus' appearances. Group hallucinations are like, in order to understand how absurd it is to have group hallucinations, you have to understand what a hallucination is. And a hallucination is a very private thing. This is something that is a product of your own mind. And uh, as such, you, what you're hallucinating, I can't hallucinate the same thing because I don't have access to your inner experience. Biochemistry. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so, so since you're having a private hallucination, that means that I have to have my own private hallucination. Um, and the, the odds of that happening two times of the same thing or similar things is very unlikely. But then, and it just becomes multiplied more when it's three, four, 12, 500. That, it just becomes unfeasible. Yeah, when 500 people hallucinate the same thing, we call that real. Yeah, <laughs> yes. You know, one question I could hear people asking is, well, did the disciples lie about their experiences? Yeah, and um, that is a uh, theory that hasn't uh, been treated with much respect. It's just because when you read the uh, the New Testament, they don't give the impression that they're lying. You know, when you read these documents, it seems like these are genuine people who are seeking God and to live out what they call the way to the best of their ability. And you touched on this earlier regarding the, they were willing to die for this. You know, um, what we have, the earliest witnesses we have regarding the lives of the disciples is that they all died for their faith, with the exception of John, who persevered in the faith and was uh, miraculously rescued from being boiled yes. alive in oil. And, uh, and he let, uh, lived the rest of his days in exile. Uh, but, uh, but you don't die for something that you don't believe in. A great way to contrast this view was is the Watergate scandal. You know, uh, the most powerful people in America couldn't hold that scandal together for two weeks. They fell apart instantly and they weren't even going to suffer death or torture. But the disciples withstood torture resulting in death and never recanted. And that uh, is powerful testimony that it they is. genuinely believed what it they is. were saying. Now, someone could push back and say, well, there's plenty of martyrs today who die for their faith, 
who didn't see Jesus rise from the dead. So couldn't the original disciples just have relied on something that they had heard as opposed to them actually seeing Jesus? And the issue with that is that the disciples, one, we, we see over the course of the Gospels and, and they're by their own testimony, that they didn't fully get the role of the Messiah in Jesus' earthly ministry. Even they were waiting, even after everything he taught and everything they saw, they were waiting for him to topple Rome. And seeing him die on the cross was a, 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 a giant like shift in perspective for them. And so to go from scattering, to go from denying Jesus because you just saw the man you thought was going to defeat Rome die on a cross, to go from that broken mental state to I'm going to die claiming that he rose from the dead, that is a leap that is incomparable to uh, people uh, being martyred today. And I don't think it's the simplest explanation. I don't know if that, that, that's fair. Yeah, that's totally fair. Um, Something that you uh, touched on as well that I think that we need to dive into a little bit is that uh, it's, it's a very un-Jewish thing to believe that uh, Jesus by himself was resurrected. The Jews believed in a resurrection, at least, you know. Not the Sadducees. Not the Sadducees, <laughs> yes. but there were... Uh, there was a Jesus taught in a resurrection. And so Martha, Lazarus' sister, talked about this final resurrection. When Jesus uh, talked about, he yeah. believed that he'll live again. And she said, yes, at the final, when everyone is resurrected. Um, it was un-Jewish for them to believe that one person would be resurrected from the dead. So this, it would be counterintuitive for them to just uh, go from, oh, he died, and then, oh, he, and make up that he resurrected or just to have that kind of hallucination. Another aspect of hallucinations is that they only are of things that you already believe. So if you don't believe that one person was gonna become resurrected, then you're not gonna hallucinate that they're going to, that, that one person resurrected. At the end of the day, to go back to your original point, and you could call this Occam's razor as well, is the best explanation is often the simplest explanation and one that doesn't require all these nooks and crannies and separate difficult explanations that don't explain the whole. So when you talk about the four, the four aspects of the resurrection that are historically, we would say historically verifiable and lean to the credibility, the best explanation is that Jesus is who he says he was. And we believe that the resurrection vindicates that. He claimed to be God in the flesh. He came, he lived the perfect life that we couldn't. He died the death we deserved. He rose in victory over Satan, sin, and death so that for those who trust in his name as their Lord and Savior, they would share in that victory over Satan, sin, and death. And it's the cornerstone of the gospel message, which is why Paul says, if it's not true, then we are to be more pitied than anyone else. Yes. Because um, the, the Christian life is a pitiable life if the resurrection isn't a historical fact, which is why we come to it and um, we find hope in it and we build off of it and we cling to it uh, because it ripples into every aspect of our life and our faith. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, the resurrection of uh, Jesus is uh, fundamental to uh, how we view reality. So it, it definitely needs to be something that uh, uh, one uh, takes uh, time to study. And a great place to learn more about this, because uh, Zach and I have only scratched the surface. We, there is a lot more that can be said about this. And uh, a great resource uh, for getting more information about this is like reasonablefaith.org, which is uh, Dr. William Lane Craig's website. Uh, you can also read books from uh, Gary Habermas or Mike Lacona. Those are really good resources for it. If you're nerdy and want a really big book, N.T. Wright's uh, book on the resurrection. Uh, yeah, that's a great book. Yeah. It's a big one. It's, it's a, a big good one. one. It's this thick. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. We hope that you're encouraged um, by the truth and the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and all that it means for the way that we live, the way that we worship, and for our eternity. See you next time. Yeah.